if you're seeing Martha's face, that means you're seeing um, Martha McPhee, a novelist who's also the director of our reading series, and uh, which is in its what, 13th year, Martha? I, I think it's beyond, <laughs> <laughs> right? Jenny, maybe 15, 16, we're, we're up there. Uh, we're so getting old. <laughs> I, I know. We, I think Norma, it's 17. 17, really? Wow. Uh, and normally, uh, Major would be signing a poster of himself with his signature. I don't know how we could manage that. <laughs> because usually we have a physical poster on campus and then we display it in the library or in the halls. But we'll figure something out. Um, we probably should begin, I think. Yes, maybe. Um, So those of you, again, because I can't see all of you, I'm only seeing a few uh, because with, with Zoom, I can't see everyone simultaneously. There's more than, there's a, a wonderful abundance of people and therefore it would probably be at least three or four screens. Um, so I'm just trusting that uh, you're hearing me. I'm just uh, welcome, uh, Major Jackson gave a marvelous uh, conversation uh, that was conducted really by him, by the students, mostly questions different students asked. And we could have gone on for hours, um, except we wanted uh, Major to have his voice left so <laughs> that he could give his reading. I'm going to preface um, my brief introduction with a few sentences uh, from a response Major Jackson wrote or said uh, in res you know, for an interview that appeared in Superstition Review in, in spring of 2014. Um, it's an interview actually called Cosmological Witnessing and it perhaps was uh, in response to Leaving Saturn, uh, which is your first book. Um, and I was mentioning to, to Major that in the news today, there's this discovery that the muon uh, behaves in ways that uh, defy the laws of physics and they're gonna to have to sort of go back to the drawing board. Uh, so I feel as if your eye has always been on the cosmic as well as on the earthly from the very outset. But um, these few sentences that I'm quoting are as follows. Poems should be as complex as existence and as layered. I've always been a believer that a poem reflects the richness of one's interiority. I only partially know who I am because of others around me, other artists and thinkers, and how they have articulated their vision and existence. The mysteries become for a moment known and resolved. These are gifts. Rereading Major Jackson's work these last few weeks in preparation for tonight, Two images kept recurring. A potter at his wheel, following and reshaping the ever-changing clay. A child tossing a ball, letting it bounce, traveling where it will, finding it with delight, then starting the process again letting it bounce again. Play, sheer play, and the absolute seriousness it takes to follow one's material where it wants to go, within the medium, becoming the medium for its journey so that even an obstacle becomes a passageway. I was looking around for some other information about Major Jackson, knowing that he had recently moved from being a professor many years, a distinguished professor already at University of Vermont, distinguished here, not having to do with age, but um, quality <laughs> of professorship. And I found an absolutely charming course description for a one day workshop that he was going to be giving, uh, I guess that was just a month ago in March, I believe of 2021, at the Hugo House, which is a special uh, writing center in Seattle, Washington. Reading this brief course description made me feel as if I were listening to 
an Ars Poetica. And I thought I would read it because it really opens a window, I think, onto um, how Major Jackson approaches the art of poetry. This exploratory generative poetry workshop is designed to highlight the severe and beautiful truths of our lives and where in language we strike our greatest freedom. Based in the belief that poems that are pure, honest, and courageous in saying the unsayable get us closer to the highest reaches of human song, Workshop participants will learn techniques of writing poetry that stress tapping the unconscious and facing our fears while nominally, nominally addressing form as a doorway into the mysteries that make up our lyric selves. Major Jackson's newest collection is bookmarked at the beginning with a poem called Major and I, which is a very direct allusion to a great short piece of writing, Borges and I by Borges, a prose poem. And the other end of the book, the book closes with a poem entitled Double Major. <laughs> so it's as, one, it's as if we have a mirror in a mirror refracting infinitely because double major is not only the doubling self, but also the musical meaning of double major and also perhaps what it means to double major in one's life in something pragmatic and something metaphysical. Major Jackson's newest collection, The Absurd Man, takes its title from a series of 25 poems, The Absurd Man Suite, a sequence that closes the collection and opens new doors to new vistas exploring new means of lyric expression. To introduce this suite, Major chose a sentence by Albert Camus, a fitting epigraph that reveals this poet's aesthetic and ethical ambitions, his passion for authenticity, for freedom of mind and independence of spirit. As an artist in his time, as a person in time, truly and absurdly aiming for eternity. I want to liberate my universe of its phantoms and to people it solely with flesh and blood truths whose presence I cannot deny. Those are Camus' words that are brother <laughs> to Major Jackson's book. A few poems into the series, which begins with The Absurd Man at 14, we find a sage walking a dirt road muddied from an afternoon rain and continue a slide into adult territory, a simultaneously ascent and descent. The voice of Europa Revisited says, I fear, I fear the monument we make with tongue and immaculate thoughts, merely an assembly for our noiseless and insatiable bodies. But the next poem, through this poet's sleight of hand, sleight of hand, the tone alters, and we enter a different room, the familiar yet unfamiliar, uncanny space of an unrhymed sonnet, a portrait, anti-portrait of grandfather, grandson, satirical, ironic, its title announcing the most beautiful man never performs hard labor. And yet, by the sonnet's close, Lorca, shows up, or what is left to us of him, his words alone. In a collection, this younger poet, still among the living, carries in the basket of his bicycle along with a baguette. Under a fruit tree, the living poet savors a moment of leisure. The bread will be broken, the book broken open, the necessary sustenance will be shared. Major Jackson is the author of five books of poetry, most recently, The Absurd Man, published in 2020. His other collections in reverse chronological order are Roll Deep, published in 2015, Holding Company, 2010, Hoops, 2006, and Leaving Saturn, 2002, which won the Cave Canem Poetry Prize for first book of poems. He edited The Best American Poetry 2019 and Ranga for Obama 
as well as the Library of America's edition of County Cullen Collected Poems. A recipient of fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, Major Jackson was honored by the Witterbinner Poetry Foundation in conjunction with the Library of Congress. His other honors include a Pushcart Prize and a Whiting Writers Award. He has published poems and essays in American Poetry Review, the New Yorker, Paris Review, Plowshares, Poetry, Poetry London, among other magazines. In another, or should I say earlier life, Major served as an arts administrator in Philadelphia. And for many years, he was on the faculty of the University of Vermont. He currently serves as the poetry editor of the Harvard Review and now lives in Nashville, Tennessee, where he is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Chair in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. Please join me in welcoming this remarkable poet and truly marvelous person, Major Jackson. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you so much for that um, capacious and generous uh, introduction. And I mentioned earlier um, to Phyllis's student, she's, she's been my big sister in poetry in a lot of ways, modeling a way of living and being in the art um, and also um, reflecting, contributing rather, I should say, to the important discussions around its making. I want to thank um, my colleagues, Martha and other colleagues uh, in creative writing there at Hofstra. It's such an honor uh, to join you um, and your students um, and the Hofstra family. Um, it's, it's really um, exciting to be part of a 17 year old tradition called Great Readings, Great Writers. Um, and thank you for that, uh, that clarification on distinguished. I, I feel like it's a title that uh, I will, I am earning an age, but I have to earn uh, uh, continually. We, we come humbled to the page and our computers and journals um, and these moments too. So I wanna thank friends who are uh, here uh, listening in and reading. Um, so I'm going to uh, begin, I've been going through old volumes, trying to pull together a next book and it looks like it'll be new and selected. So I'm gonna read some, some old poems, I'll read some new poems and then I'll end with some work. Uh, some of the poems from uh, The Absurd Man, which published uh, literally uh, a, a week or two before um, we all went into lockdown. And uh, we used to have this phrase that we, um, over at uh, Bennington College, a residency was called a vortex and nothing can compete with the vortex that is a global pandemic. So I'm just honored to have uh, this time with you and to share uh, some new poems and recently published poems, as well as older poems. This uh, first poem is called uh, How to Listen. And uh, it's one of the poems that close out my first book. And I feel like a lot of my early poems, now that I think about it, have uh, set off uh, a mission for, for the work. And one of them, for me as a writer, has been the pay attention and I kind of strike that note with this poem which takes place uh, <laughs> uh, in Philadelphia at a uh, at a famous literary bar um, a bunch of denizens used to kind of hang out here you'll hear it early on uh, but this this actually happened how to listen I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's Tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day combing his thatch of gray hair, corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, we won't talk about the end of the world or Vietnam or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, 
I'm going to ignore the profanity and the dancing and the jukebox so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky stretch of faint stars. <clears throat> this uh, poem, next poem is, uh, will publish uh, soon enough, uh, but it take is, takes its inspiration from a uh, poem of the same title by um, Philip Levine. And then after that, it, it departs. <laughs> It's titled, Let Me Begin Again. Let me begin again as a quiet thought in the shape of a shell slowly examined by a brown child on a beach at dawn, straining to see their future. Let me begin this time knowing the drumming in my dreams is me inheriting the earth, is morning lighting up the rivers. Let me burn my vanities, old music in the pines, sifters of scotch, a day moon like a signature of night. This time, let me circle the island of my fears only once, then live like a raging waterfall and grow a magnificent mustache. Let me not ever be the birdcage or the serrated blade or the empty season. Dear glacier, dear sea of stars, dear leopards disintegrating at the outer limits of our greed, soon we will encounter you only in motivational tweets. Reader, I should have married you sooner. This time, let me not sleep like the prophet who believes he's seen infinity. Let me run at breakneck speeds toward sceneries of doubt. I have no more dress rehearsals to attend. Look closer. I am licking my lips. Uh, this poem I'm reading, I wrote it uh, a couple years ago, but it references a poet that was important to me who recently passed away. Uh, among a constellation of poets, as you can hear, I, I feel like so much of my work feels sponsored um, by the thoughts of other writers, definitely uh, poets. This is titled, uh, well, the poet that passed away is Adam Zagajewski. Uh, this is titled Points of Clarification. And though I say here sorrow beguiles me, I lose no sleep. And though I say our country's journey is one long rigmarole, its villages and ridges are succulent and sweet. And though I say here, watch me now, watch me. Truly, I'm shy as stage curtains, demure as tiny cups of espresso. And though I quote Wordsworth, Zagajewski, and Dow, I come from gunshots and beat downs, raw and dirty, the day was mild, the light was generous. And though I've said in the past, I wear September on my face, which is eternal. I treasure too, June morning soaked in song, July's fevered cauldron wilting us to seared spinach. And though we say darkness succumbs to the light. I've been reading Faust, questioning the morality of knowledge, our icebergs and mountains, auction, earth collapsing, human flesh for money, crickets barking loud as generals. And though we say, I do unto, death do on cue, I'll forever hold her, a jewelry box in my lap full of prayers and stays against confusion. And though they say, world without religions, without revelations, instinct effaced by reason, I swear I can reach up and touch your laughter. Uh, many of us after the events of last summer were moved to write poems that um, added to the important message of the dignity of all peoples. Um, and some of us have been 
doing that for a while and feeling an, a sense of exhaustion, fighting against all of the isms, anti-Semitism, anti-Blackness, and now, of course, not now, always anti-Asian sentiments. Um, I felt called once again, being one of those who felt the sense of exhaustion. This is titled, Think of Me Laughing. You are right to imagine me sobbing on the corner of Sixth Avenue and West Fourth, or raising a hashtag cardboard above my head near the Liberty Bell. You are right to picture me lying down below the go dome capital demanding don't shoot. It is my annual day of sobbing. What are these brown hands for if not to bury my eyes in the ancient rivers of wrongs? And isn't this my consigned single note and our final piece of music, mindless as a blink? So go ahead. You and I are once again rehearsing decency. It is the dream of loving fruited plains that do not love you back. It is our feet planted in concrete that has me weep. But first, give thought to my luxuries. The sunset I toasted over the Val de Schiana with an aperitivo in Cafe Polesiano, the summer of 15. Or give thought to the promontories of conversation with my father yesterday, in which, among other delights, we discussed the dignity of eggplants, whose purplish tint reminded him of a great aunt. Consider my love of celestial bodies. You're better off thinking of me singing this morning a little Marvin Gaye. Not what's going on, but I want you, sultry and soulful, a one-way love is just a fantasy. Oh, sugar, forgive me for being bound up in the ecstatic right now. I do not regret my little bout with life. Uh, if you live in New York, I think you've seen this poem on the subway, uh, which I'm very proud of that <laughs> poems gonna have a life far beyond what you imagine them. Leave it all up to me. And it comes from that, um, that book that was assigned, at least poems were assigned from it. It was published in Holding Company some years ago. Leave it all up to me. All we want is to succumb to a single kiss that will contain us like a marathon with no finish line. And if so, that we land like newspapers before sunrise, halcyon mornings like blue martinis. I am learning the steps to her foreign song. Her mind was torpedo and her body was storm, a kind of wow. All we want is a metropolis of Sundays, an empire of handholding and park benches. She says, leave it all up to me. So uh, sometimes I get into, I, I'm often asked about, um, often asked about creative process. And I realized uh, putting together this new and selected, so much of, of my approach to poems is very simply creating a litany or a catalog. And that becomes the rhetorical act in of itself, um, but occasionally there is a hint of a of a narrative to kind of make it tie together, and uh, such was the case uh, with uh, this this poem uh, titled "The Flaneur Tends a Well Like Summer Cocktail," which is in uh, from the Absurd Man, <clears throat> and it has one of those 
titles that begins with the beginning of the sentence. Uh, and the art here is Jean art, and the other artist that's uh, reflected here or mentioned here is Robert Cole Scott, wonderful artist. He did a very satirical, beautiful, crazy, surreal painting of, of Washington crossing the Delaware that I'll, I'll recommend that you check out. Uh, the Flaneur tends a well-liked summer cocktail curbside on an arc-like table. He's alone, of course, in the arts district, as it were, legs folded, swaying a foot so that his body seems to summon some deep immensity from all that surrounds. Dusk shadows inching near a late 30-ish couple debating the post-galactic abyss of sex with strangers. Taurus ambling by only to disappear into the street's gloomy mouth. A young Italian woman bending to retrieve a drop Metro card, its black magnetic strip facing up. A lone speckled brown pigeon breaking from a flock of rock doves, then landing near a crushed fast food wrapper, newly tossed by a bike messenger. The man chortling after a sip of flaxen colored beer, remembering that in the gospel of John, the body and glory converge linked to incarnation. And so perhaps we manifest each other. A tiny shower of sparks erupting from the knife sharpener's truck who daily leans a blade into stone. A cloudscape reflected in the rear windshield of a halted taxi where inside a trans woman applies auburn lipstick. The warlike insignia on the lapel jacket of a white gloved doorman who opening a glass door gets a whiff of a dowager's thick perfume and recalls bailing Timothy Hay as a boy in Albania. The woman distractedly watching a mother discuss Robert Cole Scott's lurid appropriations of modernist art over Niswa's salad, suddenly frees her left breast from its cup where awaits the blossoming mouth of an infant wildly reaching for a galaxy of milk. The sharp coughs of a student carrying a yoga mat, the day's last light edging high rises on the west side so that they seem rim by fire, just when the man says, and yet immense the wages we pay, boarding the great carousel of flesh. Decide to move around. Mighty pawns. It's about a chess player. I grew up with faintly, more or less so. And it's a one sentence poem, Mighty Pawns. If I told you, Earl, the toughest kid as could beat any man or woman in 10 moves playing white, or that he traveled to Yugoslavia to frustrate the bearded masters at the Belgrade Chess Association, you'd think I was given to hyperbole. And if at dinner time, I took you into the faint light of his section eight home, reeking of onions, liver, and gravy, his six little brothers fighting on a broken love seat for room in front of a cracked flat screen, one whose diaper sags, it's a wonder it hasn't fallen to his ankles. And the walls behind doors exposing sheetrock, the perfect O of a handle. And the slats of stairs missing, where baby boy gets stuck trying to ascend to a dominion foreign to you and me with its loud timbales and drums blasting down from the closed room of his cousin, whose mother stands on a corner on the other side of town all times of day and night, 
except when her relief check arrives at the beginning of the month, you'd get a better picture of Earl's ferocity. After school, on the board, in Mr. Sherman's class, but not necessarily when he stands near you. At a downtown bus stop in a jacket a size too small, hunching his shoulders around his ears as you imagine the checkered squares of his poverty and anger and pray he does not turn his precise gaze too long in your direction for fear he blames you and proceeds to take your queen. <clears throat> I'm gonna read uh, a poem I haven't read in a while. I, I, some poems I really like reading and it's just because I like getting into uh, the cadence and the, and the music. This is a, a poem that I wrote driving cross country to go uh, to graduate school a long time ago. And uh, when I hit the West, it was all big sky and wonder. And I was just so happy to kind of do the open road drive. Very iconic thing to do if you are young and an American, right? Um, but then I got stopped by a state police and he was writing up a ticket for me speeding in fact, I was desperately trying to get out of Kansas. Nothing wrong with Kansas. It was just, I wanted to get to a place where I can get food and not worry, if you know what I mean. Um, and so I started this poem and I was listening to a wonderful jazz musician named Freddie Hubbard. And that's where the poem begins. And cars back then, if you were under a certain age, um, you didn't have Bluetooth and you didn't even have a CD player. You had a cassette player. Indian song. Freddie Hubbard's playing the cassette deck, 40 miles outside Hayes. And I've looked at this Kansas sunset for three hours now, bristling as big rigs bounce and grumble along I-70. At this speed, cornfields come in splotches, murky yellows and greens, abutting the road's shoulder, the flat wealth of the nation whirring by. It's a kind of ornamentation I've gotten used to, as in a dream, espaliered against the sky's blazing, clout loves cascade lace-like, darkening whole fields. 30,000 feet above, someone is buttering a muffin. Someone stares at a sky phone, and momentarily a baby cries in pressurized air. Through double pane squares, someone squints, fields cross hatched by asphalt strips. It is said, Cezanne looked at a landscape so long he felt as if his eyes were bleeding. No matter that, I'm heading west. It's all so regulent, this wailing music, by my side, you fingering fields of light, sunflowers over earth, miles traveled, a patchwork of goodbyes. Not only <laughs> does this poem contain outdated technology like a cassette deck, but I was just realizing, uh, I don't think they serve food on planes anymore. Okay, if they do, they're like, you know, you got to fly a far distance. And there's definitely not any more sky phones. Do they still have sky phones on planes? That was something, wasn't it? Now you can get Wi Fi and stay connected, uh, which is how I like to fly. <laughs> connected. <laughs> okay. Um, this is uh, where'd it go? Yeah, um, this is from Urban Renewal and it's from a sequence called the Augustine Suite. And this is section three. That window 
at the Grand Hotel Palazzo in Laverno framed the Tyrrhenian Sea. A white bordered postcard he placed gently on an imaginary wire rack below other views accruing, whose postmarks he'd yet to stamp, so they swiveled in his mind involuntarily and slowed with a squeak. Perched angels standing guard on the bridge of Sant'Angelo, the crenellated line of cliffs above some coast, a shop owner waving farewell, a series of roundabouts whose circles he never completed, the half erect heads of sunflowers like a cavalry in training, all cliches of travel. Even the waterfront terraza with its checkered board squares, but not her pillowed beauty. Still sunk in sleep, a soft coating of night sweat on her face, her neck lengthening to a modigliani, the arrowing flashes of fallen stars he preyed upon were superfluous. Their places changed, but she would remain like the horizon whose light increased, flooding their rented rooms. Dawn arrived, the shrieking seagulls circled into view, next a ferry launched to fulfill its roots so flip this over, a scene scrawled in lines clear as Greek, stealthily composed, then slipped under his door like a hotel receipt. Read um, three more poems. And um, I'm grateful for my friend, Phyllis, uh, referencing the, what'd you, how'd you favorite a, a, a dual mirror? Uh, I'm gonna I'm use that in some interview. I, I like that, thank you for that. Uh, this is one of one side of the mirror. This is double major. Uh, actually, I, I keep reading this. I'm gonna read major and I. I haven't read that one in a while. Um, and we were talking in class about um, abstracting the self as a way of, of pushing away from some of what can drive our writing, i.e. the ego. Um, and once I, I felt as though once that happens, then um, when you can realize that your work is a constructed uh, a series of voices in a poem and not necessarily the self, then it allows for a different relationship to your art that feels a little bit more communal and a little bit more sacred, um, spiritual, and while also, of course, engaging in so much of the secular. Uh, Major and I, Major and I, hand in hand, remove our dark suits, but the other Major prefers to undress in glass revolving doors. He is a fan of prohibition cocktails whose potions afford him time travels of the landed gentry. I let Major sport his dangers, which magnify his ambitions so he can write his grandulent poems. And thus, ours is a compromised relationship. I more cautious than a slug, and he the sampler of pythons. Major is a fan of Peruvian folk songs, wood panel libraries, rare colognes, and old issues of Esquire. I, on the other hand, prefer American football, treasury bills, and vintage sports cars. Only once did I try to escape his clutches, this other major. For years, I survived his ranked songs, which makes the Spanish cantors weep. His fingers carry the bitter taste of coffee, which occasionally I sniff, for they are the color of ancient bark. Forgive his pretenses, he who wrote that last sentence. It is probably true he wrote most of this, but I am unsure, for I lived just behind him, a single keystroke, shy of his many thoughts. Beware his black 
rituals. The other major flies in his daydreams, which means he's collecting a paradise of mirrors where I sit studying the prose of Faulkner, Morrison, Toomer. Latinate though he is, master of the outside, he digs the gangsta lane and is more thankful than a sunroof top. His broken strings, like his stubble, issue forth a wintry path at night for white walls. See what I mean? Major never won attendance awards. And for sure, long ago, he left behind cigarettes and the guarded strips of lotto tickets, but cherishes still the big hit. Admit his charms and you've a friend for life. He will send you sunflowers, true even from his coffin, not true. And although he never learned to play the violin or the mouth harp, a radio plays like an all night laundromat behind his eyes. And thus he lives year round in the boot camp of self redemption. For this, the other major needs lots of sky. You are that sky. Well, as you can hear, that was a lot of fun to write. <clears throat> and uh, God, um, yeah, two more. This is, uh, now that you are here, I can think. What you really are is felt. The mainland of your feelings, a young Veronica Webb, and what we share are solutions and not so much the Parisian air you tired of, nor the fat sweaty bead coursing a decolletage, an unlikely consequence of the Kyoto protocol, but the pleasures of lounging below French style windows open wide as arms whose blousy curtain is a shawl that formally hangs and informally shifts when you drift into the room like a spikely dolly shot. The kids are dancing to some Ariana, but I'm watching what you do with your lips when reading silently around 4.22 p.m. on a late Sunday afternoon. I have a weakness for marble winding stairs and tight two-person elevators, but the brasseries are waiting, as well as the football fans who need help cheering, for we are Americans after all and are ready to hype even the locusts on the day of judgment. I don't care about the midfielder or the winger. You're smiling and that's all the defending I'll ever need. And finally, <clears throat> thank you for your patience and your attention. Um, in the 80s, we did the WAP. <clears throat> if you end your crusades for the great race, then I will end my reenactments of flying. And if you lean down to smell a painted trillium, then I will cast a closer eye on those amber waves. And if you stop killing black children, then I will turn my drums to the sea and away from your wounded mountains. Who mothered your love of death? Here's a heart-shaped stone to rub. When you feel fear rising, give me anything, an empty can of paps, a plastic souvenir, a t-shirt from Daytona. Here's a first edition the collected poems of Lucille Clifton. Give me an ancient grove and a conversation by a creek, charms to solve my grief, something that says you are human. And I will give you the laughter in my brain and the tranquil eyes of my uncles. Show me your grin in the middle of winter. In the eighties, we did the WAP. You too, have your dances. It is like stealing light from a flash in the sky. I promise no one is blaming you. No one is trying to replace you. 
It's just that you are carrying an ancient clock, calling it European history, standing in khakis, eyes frightened like a mess of beetles. Thank you so much for listening to those poems. Very, very grateful. Happy you're here. Thank you, Major Jackson. Um, now, you have been so generous um, to us and with us um, and such a wonderful range of poems. And I'm pretty sure there are a few questions from people in the audience and I, I'm assuming that if you type your question, I will read it aloud and, and then Major Jackson will respond. It's possible also that some people can unmute themselves. I'm not sure, Athleen or Carol, how are, how are we working that? You can unmute and you can call on them or they can raise their hand, which will move them up to the top. So I won't see the hand. I've never been able to figure out that. Um, I, honestly, I don't I'll, see. I'll it. help you if I if I see if I see a question. It doesn't show up on my screen at all. Only the chat does. Um, I don't. So anyone? Um, I know a few of my students who didn't get to ask questions. Is if Cami, you're there, you might have a question. Um, Jolie, you might have a question. But whoever has a question, please feel free. And my and you don't have to be a hospital student. If you're in the audience, um, you are welcome to, to comment or ask a question. Here we go. Rocco, Rocco has a question. Yeah, Rocco, now that's showing up under participants. Very good. <laughs> Rocco? Hello, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jackson, it's been a pleasure listening to your work uh, over the last hour, and it's been an honor to um, hear your wisdom in, in as terms of writing. And I had just one more question that I didn't get to ask you before. We're here here honoring this these words and just the words of the collective words of of our humanity, right? How do you? What is your technique for discipline to make sure? Like what, what's a good strategy to get a writer in front of the page mm. if they're having trouble doing that? What are your mm. techniques? Oh, God, it changes up. I used to, well, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt to have a long stretch of time. We were talking about, um, about fellowships and creating some infrastructure that allows you to be the writer and, and artist um, uh, an observant person that you are. So that's the first thing I, I would say. Um, and I guess after that, there, there was, I, I've given myself assignments, as you know, we were talking about sequences. And even though who knows when they're going to finish, why I like them is because the mountain is there and I can always return to them to go on that journey upwards and keep uh, keep uh, my kind of imaginative and creator and makerly life um, uh, active. And I, I feel like projects are good for that reason. On occasions, they can run awry, they can be a little overly ambitious, or, or maybe the talent doesn't match the ambition. That's okay too. Uh, so projects, I, I would say. And I guess next to that, um, I just find deep inspiration from other writers and musicians and playwrights and artists and dancers and singers. And so I've made, I've, I've made sure that um, I am as much of a patron of the arts as well as a practitioner and inspiration is all around me. So. For me personally, if I read a good book or a good poem, it, it, there's a, a wee bit of envy. Okay, if I'm honest, there's a lot of envy, but it sends me back uh, to my own desk. And that's a, that's a wonderful uh, space to be as well. Um, writing, creating some, some routine. I'm, I, I'm disciplined, but I'm not disciplined like, let's say, um, Wow, I was about to say some names. I probably shouldn't do that. But, uh, but I do give myself, particularly in the summers, I create a, 
a routine for myself, a schedule. Every week I create a schedule of when I'm going to write and I stick, stick with that. Even if nothing comes, I know that I sat down and uh, put myself in a position for something to, uh, to happen. But it, it is a challenge. There's so much around us that calls our attention. Um, there's the, the big, I would say the, the, the big kind of door to kind of open up is our own feelings of insecurity or even a, a, a right to claim time and space in our day to do something, writing poetry, that someone may figure is um, not as much of a contribution as say, um, serving the state in some office or serving serving the community in some fashion. So we, we have to get over that. And, and that goes to something I said earlier, which is I, I, I so appreciate the support of friends who are also writers. And it feels like we're journeying together. And when someone gets in that space of self-doubt, um, we come to each other's, um, we come to each other with the kind of embrace that's meant to continue the journey on. So thank you for that question, Raka. Another question, a crastic writer. I don't know who that is, but whoever you are. That's Janae. Hi, hi. Um, so happy National Poetry Month. Uh, my question to you is if you were to give a public service announcement to Americans <laughs> for National Poetry Month, what would you say to them? Wow. Uh, one, uh, bring back poems on the radio daily in the morning. I, I, I don't care who reads it, but that did such a such an important service to rendering um, uh, language, artful language as an essential element of our lives. Um, it won't save us from all of the kind of social ills, but at least there's a gesture towards the import of the human spirit and soul. And it also cultivates, and I think this is the great thing about National Poetry Month, um, it, it cultivates active listening or a different kind of listening that goes beyond mere exchange um, that our society, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's a more intense, uh, intentional kind of listening that poetry um, encourages. Uh, I'll, I'll add to that, embrace all kinds of poetry. To do that, meaning not just poems that kind of make us feel good about our lives, but the poems that possibly question, uh, that interrogate, that resist, um, that maybe even what most of us need uh, a sense of, of order. Maybe we want to encounter poems that highlight the disorder that is uh, being alive in the world uh, today um, where everything doesn't make sense. So uh, my big PSA is to kind of read widely, listen deeply, listen vertically, read vertically. Um, and embrace an art form that is, as uh, someone said recently, that reflects the ongoing human consciousness and memory. That's that's the great the great aspect of this art. You know, thank wow, thanks, Janie. <laughs> I see Christian. I'm gonna call names too. Please, yeah. <laughs> Um, hi, Mr. Jackson. So, um, yeah, it's really great to be here with you and hear your work. Uh, once again, I'm always humbled whenever I read or hear you. Um, and yeah, this is kind of a question I've been thinking about um, for a while, um, following your work, because I was I was pretty inspired when I found out um, we came from similar roots, you know, in uh, Philadelphia and Central High School. But I, I noticed you had a really rich uh, journey, you know, outside of that, um, not just in poetry, but 
um, you know, traveling to different places. And I was wondering, you know, especially as I'm about to start my own journey, um, how has your poetry evolved as you've traveled to different places and seen different things in parts of the country and parts of the world um, outside of your home? Mm -hmm. Chris, it's good to see you. And I'm honored that you're here. And I appreciate the substance of that uh, question. Um, in a way, I guess, you know, it's interesting. Someone asked me recently about the importance of place as a writer. And, you know, bar none, it's the foundation of who we are and what launches us into being um, curious individuals, uh, but also kind of rooted. And that rootedness, um, is cultural, uh, that rooted is, is rituals, that rooted is um, where we come from gives us a sense of identity, but also maybe even more importantly, a sense of sound, one that we can measure um, and compare out uh, in the world. Traveling for me, or at least going beyond Philadelphia, beginning with uh, um, summers in Nashville, Tennessee with my family, but then afterwards, just pursuing, finding ways to kind of extend uh, my life as a writer, which has taken me up to New England and out west, um, the Northwest for college and down south to kind of teach early teaching years uh, up to Vermont. And then um, currently uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, funny enough, finding a circular way back to ancestral land. Um, what's been important for me is, is getting an understanding of both the, the width of human, um, human experience, but also uh, those great pockets of similarities. And I, I'm very conscious of that. And uh, as I've kind of traveled um, into other countries, what's been important to me is, is not to learn monuments, but to get acquainted to the to the poems of the people who I'm sharing dinner with, um, I want to hear their music. I want to know what what rituals and traditions and myths and stories and narratives um, have made them to to who they are today. And it's a different kind of of I won't say tourism, but it's a different kind of way of existing in the world. You want to kind of um, go beyond the surface. We know the surface. We know what those monuments are for, uh, which is why we need to revisit the monuments here in the, in the U.S. Um, but really listening, listening into the fabric of a people, I, that couldn't have happened without the grounding that I got in Philadelphia. And it's, it's good to see you for sure. Another question, and feel free to just speak and then maybe your name will show up. To extend that one more. Ron Jansen, I know you just wrote a little comment that today is, Ron, hello. I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, you wrote to me, I suppose, saying, by the way, today is Wordsworth 251st birthday and you weren't with us with the conversation that I had with some of my students um, in my sonnet tradition class and a few other students also participated from 5 to 6 p.m. but um, we were talking in some ways though never mentioning Wordsworth uh, very much about the origins of that exploration of the self and subjectivity. Mm. Um, I don't know Ron if you wanted to ask major anything connected to the, um, the romantic tradition? <laughs> Not so much the tradition, but I've been, I've been reading uh, Wordsworth lately by, by coincidence. I didn't know his birthday was coming up, but, but the sense of self in Wordsworth, as I listen to your poetry and the, uh, um, the double majors and the triple majors <laughs> and however many majors you have there, you know, it made me think about reading the prelude, for example, and his mm -hmm. investigation of self mm -hmm. and then 
the depth that he goes to. It's really fascinating. I wonder how you how you feel. I mean, mm -hmm. I think about yourself as, as requires you to be yourself and not be yourself somehow. I wonder how that that feels. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I I go back and forth to um, well, first of all, Wordsworth is definitely and all and chiefly the Romantics and. Someone was talking about um, sometimes a country and an age will only give you two poets in one particular age mm -hmm. who are great, but the you know the British romantics there, you know not one, two, three, but six of them we can we can point to. And Wordsworth was definitely important in in my education, particularly um, intimations of the old intimations of immortality. Um, but I, I I go back and forth between. Whitman's celebration of the self, um, because that is, um, or the idea that we contain multi multitudes. But then I also realized that um, the, the, the chief component of that, uh, or the missing, the missing variable in that discussion of containing multitudes is that it's the writing that, that creates us. And that's what I, I find quite fascinating is that in a way, the poems become a composite of a self mm -hmm. that um, someone may read as well, that's major on the page. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is um, the act of writing occasions the reflection of who one is and what is the moment that they're living in mm -hmm. and maybe even what is the purpose. And uh, we were talking earlier about the, the domain of, of philosophy in addressing these questions. And I was kind of joking about, you know, part of the reason why uh, Plato <laughs> booted poets from the ideal republic is because of that, that, um, that ability to work with, with metaphor as a way of, of understand, understanding reality and not only understanding reality, but creating reality. And that's, that's what I find fascinating in relationship to the self is that without the, without the act of writing, which is a kind of a, a mirror, but also a window, um, and many poets have shown us the way to that. And definitely the, the romantics were, the, were some of the first to break ground in lining or liming a subjective self and framing it um it's a, it's a it's a gorgeous gorgeous almost democratic act in that sense uh if we think about the history of art as being uh representative of those in power uh there's something quite beautiful in our age in which um we can write our lives into a, a existence uh, as one of reflection, but also um, to help shape us. Well, uh, hearing you say that makes me think of also back to Wordsworth, that sonnet that begins, the world is too much with us. Um, and also in the preface of the lyrical ballads, uh, that if one reads the 1798 preface to the lyrical ballads, what jumps out, I think, at a lot of people to as uh, the insights into the effect of technology is as if he's speaking about what's happening right now. He talks about how people are overstimulated. There's too much information. Everything is too fast. It was like <laughs> 1798. And it's this that's the state against confusion is it's as if the poem, the poet is not in a direct way serving the public, but is creating a space mm -hmm. that wards off what erodes the spirit mm -hmm. and and people can individually subjectively experience through the unique piece written say one of your poems anyone not just your poems as a whole but any poem you write is also a stay isn't it yeah um, in which a world can happen and other people then participate in that and that is a, a nurturing that people actually, it even has a religious function. And I mean, the religious function used to serve that purpose, I think, for people, especially right. the Bible, if you think about it, the way the Bible would give anyone who could read could have that. 
Yeah. It was, that was totally democratic. And I wonder if there's a way in which the poem can do that, but I don't know if that's something you want to address or think about or. Well, you, you said it quite well. I mean, I won't, I won't go so far as to say that, um, that the poem stops the machine, no. um, but it does uh, have us reflect and, and pause in ways that the, that the daily routines do not allow for. Uh, that's properly uh, understood with, uh, with most art. Um, but I also know that for some people, it can be quite terrifying uh, to have that, that moment of reflection or, or to encounter some part of themselves or their emotions or feelings uh, that does not feel sponsored by Hollywood or sponsored by some commercial for their hair product <laughs> or insurance. Uh, the, the, the stark reality of encountering a voice on the page can, in a, in a, in a culture that maybe doesn't, uh, as you say, have ritualized, we've lost that ritual for some of us, many of us, of, of deep reflection and the security of maybe even faith. Um, it's amazing how poetry steps in and, and you know, I'm not one to uh, bemoan the success of populist poets, even poets on on Instagram, because I know that they're tapping into that power that a lot of people need. They need the words, even if we might find the words a little bit kind of cliched or the sentiment um, running the course of doggerel. Um, it could be a gateway drug to something a little bit more uh, <laughs> deeper when um, when times come, become really, really tough and people are at a loss for something that's going to um, help calm that inner storm inside them, you know, or those questions. Thank you. Um, is there, are there one or two more questions? I think we, we're going to wrap up pretty soon, but I don't want to shut off a voice that has something to ask or say. Um, and it's possible I'm not seeing, because I'm not seeing the hand raising. I, once in a while, participant shows up as someone wants to speak, but nothing else. So if you just start speaking, you'll be there. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> well, I'll ask it, it, nobody else. Chelsea, did you want to ask something? Oh, I can um, ask a question if y'all want. Please. So something that I've been thinking about, um, especially as, uh, again, Mr. Jackson, I, your words are so insightful. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, something, two things that I think about is, um, a, how do you expose yourself to new styles? Like I noticed you, um, your work has a lot of variation in style um, and just types of poem itself. Um, so aside from, I guess, you know, just reading and continually educating yourself, um, how do you expose yourself to new styles? Um, and then also in terms of uh, something that you said today that was really, I think is really gonna stay with me is like um, living in a way and traveling in a way that means uh, understanding others. Um, what was something that brought you joy this week? Just something light. And <laughs> Just <a> light <laughs> uh, uh, well, what I was about to say is a little corny, but I'll come back to it. But as far as uh, exposing myself um, beyond reading, and that was the first thing I thought of, is that I tried to... Um, uh, read new poets and also keep my eye on the classics and and I'm definitely you know I've been guilty of saying I read something I didn't read it so I got to rush to read it you know I don't do it pretty frequently but um, uh, and I'll add to that is that I, I just get tired of my voice like really quickly and I, I feel like I've, oh, I've, I said that before, I've done that before. And so I have this kind of restless, 
restlessness as a writer. And I'm, I might even be, it might be said to um, uh, charisma, I might even be addicted to authenticity. Like I, I feel like I need to make sure, and this comes from being an editor and reading a lot, a lot of poems. Many of them I feel sound alike and I wanna make sure I don't sound like anyone else but myself. And that's a hard reach because you, you're bound to say something that someone else said before. Um, something light that brought me joy. Well, my, my son and I laugh today and that's the corny part. And we laugh because, um, <laughs> we, I'm sorry, uh, we were, we were, I was reading to him this morning some of the headlines from the newspapers. And uh, I said it in class today, a camera sees only what a camera sees. <laughs> and then we just ran with that. And, and uh, we just started laughing and just making jokes about, um, you know, a lamp only illumines what a lamp illumines. <laughs> like we just kept going on and on, you know. A road only carries <laughs> a road, whatever, only a road, you know. That came from today's uh, trial, the defense uttered that uh, with the uh, Derek Chauvin. Anyway, laughing with my son today was a great spot of joy. Um, and there's many reasons why that was very special today. I mean, we laugh all the time, but today it felt like one of those really connected, bonded laughs. Thank you for that. That was very sweet to ask that. Thank you. That's a beautiful thing to think of. And also to all of those extreme emotions, how laughter itself has is grace sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think because for both of us, we're on edge about the outcome of this, um, this court trial. And something about that laughter, um, diffused some of that tension and some of that anxiety and, and worry. Um, and it's, it's a quite serious time to live in. So any laughter we can get is just should be treasured. I think. Thank you. Is there one, there's no final questions and there's no final answers, but is there one more question anyone would like to ask before we um, we release <laughs> Major into his regular life, which is probably another life of poems. Because um, one of the things I'm noticing in your work, and I think it's maybe it's not unusual in poetry, is you're saying you don't want to sound like yourself, but you want to sound like you're, you want to be true to yourself. You want to be authentic, and yet to be authentic often means being other than oneself. Mm. Um, you know, meaning the escape from self is a way of discovering some other aspect. That's why I feel as if these alter egos, these absurdities, and actually the laughter is connected to the absurd because that mm -hmm. statement, that tautological statement is an absurdity and a person could go insane in, mm -hmm. in the face of absurdity or short circuit, you know, the neurological complication of trying to make sense of something nonsensical. But what's missing in that tautology is the person. Yeah. And yeah. meaning the, the thing is the person is the witness to what the machine sees, and it doesn't yeah. really see, it's the human. And it's this human element that you keep exploring in your work. And sometimes it's most extremely present when you seem to be detaching from humanity. Mm. Mm. Um, you're just spinning a new world. And that really is fascinating. Um, is there anything you want to say about where you think you're going next? I don't mean as a project, but what you've seen happen in your work. Um, um, that would be my question. Yeah, no, I, 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 I am writing, um, I'm writing new poems that, that feel to me have both an aesthetic edge to them and 
um, a political edge. I, I think I'm reacting to the moment and with no concern about any kind of transcendence mm -hmm. of art. Uh, and so that's that's been uh, liberating uh, as well. Um, why don't I end on a poem? Please. A very short poem. Please. And uh, this is from Holding Company. Um, and it might have echoes with some of what we discussed. It's called uh, Picket Monsters. Mm -hmm. For I was born to in the stunted winter of history. For I to desire the lion's mouth split. And the world that is not ours. And the wounded children set free to their turnstiles of wonder. I too have blinked speechless at the valleys of corpses. Wish Griabin's black mass in the executioner's ear, Ellington in the interrogation room. I now see gardens where bodies have their will, where the self is a compass point given to the lost. Let me call your name. The ground here is soft and broken. Thank you. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Major. Really wonderful. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And thank you, Carol and Atheline, for helping facilitate this. Yeah, that was wonderful. We'll just keep reading you and hearing you. <laughs>